Welcome back to the Noob Spirit Podcast. My name is Isaac Daly, aka Shrek. I'm the host of the Noob Spirit Podcast. Interviews with spearfishing experts, authorities, characters from all over the world. Today's guest, Derek Marshall Dunning at DMD Fins on Instagram. Now, Brandon, he started off as a, as an intern for Noob Spirit, helping out behind the behind the traps. Now he sort of runs our Instagram. He helps audio edit the podcast and all sorts of things. He put me on to Derek. Um, Brandon is a, is a Cape Town Spiro, just sort of starting his journey, and Derek has been someone influential in, in his spearing, so it was uh, it was a privilege to be able to get uh, Derek on the show. And uh, now we're freediving, um, spearfishing accredited in structure, had a lot to do with the Blue Spiros Club there in Cape Town, and Western Province uh, spearfishing representative, underwater rugby for South Africa. He's done a whole bunch of stuff. He's a really neat dude. Now he manufactures fins under the brand name DMD Fins on Instagram. Check him out. There's some radical designs, um, and he's a cool dude. So I'm looking forward to hitting into that interview in just two shakes of a lamb's tail. Now, Sam Vesey has left me a voicemail. Now, you can do that at noobspirit.com. Head up into the menu and go to Nuba Stories. You can record a voicemail. Now, short and sweet is awesome. Sam's voicemail is going to go on the back end of the show. Stick around for it. He's got uh, an awesome tip there about float lines and stuff. If you want to check out his YouTube channel, it's at On The Road Spearfishing on YouTube. And he's got some really cool videos there as well. But hang around to the back end of the show and listen into Sam's voicemail, a UK-based spear with a great tip. Now, Curly and WA left me an awesome message. Uh, he wrote me an email basically just saying, like, uh, just writing and becoming a patron because I appreciated the froth you've given me and also the content and time you've given back to this amazing community. I hope it's starting to make it worthwhile financially. He says, I've been diving up and down the WA coast for about 12 years, mostly around Mar- Margaret River where I live, and I've been spoiled as you can imagine. Uh, he says, I've also been entrenched in the surfing community, which I'm starting to fall out of love with due to the fact of increased crowds, massive egos, and the short-sightedness of people blowing every spot up to try and gain their little light spot in the limelight. Your podcast and the people that you interview is a breath of fresh air, and it's good to see that 80% of divers are so down to earth and are willing to share information without giving up the mystery of it all. Um, yeah, he goes on He goes on in this message. It's, it's a, it was a really uh, well thought out and a lovely email, and these are the sorts of messages that keep me going. So um, thanks for that, Curly. Anyway, he says uh, at the back end, he says, we're having a little trouble getting access to the pool. They're telling us not allowed to train without our own insurance. Um, pool insurance is, is pretty tricky. Um, AFA is your best bet in Australia. Contact them about what the requirements are. Um, USFA and AUF have limited insurance options available as far as I'm aware for uh, free dive training in the pool. But it's, a, it's an important part of it, and uh, remember, never to train alone in the pool. Um, Campbell on Patreon. He's a, a new patron uh, listener, so thanks for joining us, uh, Campbell. He says, hey, Shrek, loving the podcast, dude. Feel like I'm I'm learning every time I listen. That's why I joined up on Patreon. Originally, I'm a Kiwi from the mighty Waikato, Waikato and never really thought about sparing an NZ, but always had an itch for fishing that I could never really scratch. Uh, it goes on to just share it. Uh, keep up the great work, and the podcast is mean. So thanks, Campbell. Super exciting, guys. The 99 Spiro recipes that I've been spruiking and talking about for the last little while um, is finally up and live. And you can find out about it. If you go to noobspiro.com, you'll see there right in the front there, there's a submit your own recipe. But if you go to noobspiro.com forward slash submit recipe, um, you can get in and maybe take up some real estate in this sweet little book, which is basically crowdsourced recipes from the spearfishing community. Um I really want your recipe in there. I want you to be part of this book. Every recipe that makes it into the book, the person that submits it will get a free copy of the book. Obviously, you have much higher chances of making it in the book if you've got really um, high quality photo, photo photography, and, um, and 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 a bit of creative storytelling doesn't go amiss. Um, but check it out. Go to noobspirit.com forward slash submit recipe, and you'll see all the requirements we have there with regards to submission. It's fairly straightforward. Submissions are open till August thirty. Um, get on board. Get in and be a part of it. Now. Also, I'm, I'm still looking for some proofreaders and editors. So if you if you email me, shrek at noobspiro.com, if you'd like to be part of like beta reading, um, the editing and proofreading journey, I'd need your help. So email me, shrek at noobspiro.com. Um, longer intro today, guys. Um, I, I apologize for that, but just had so much awesome stuff happening in the community. I really have to share it with you. Sector Spearfishing, at Sector, S-E-C-T-A underscore spearfishing on Instagram, sent me a, a care package, radical t shirt some awesome tooling that they, they're they making. Really love it, these little boutique um, gear manufacturers that are just, they full of, 
passion and froth and they just uh, – they're making tools that they want themselves in their own spearfishing journey. So check it out at sector underscore spearfishing on Instagram. Massive shout-out to them. Finally, guys – a review as well to top it all off before we head into this interview with DMD Fins. Jack left a review for the podcast. He says, amazing podcast, can binge listen for hours on end. Shrek does an amazing job and great to hear the Patreon support is sending you to spare in the amazing Indian Ocean in WA. Hope you shoot a big Dewey. Um, thanks, mate. Awesome. I'm, I am, I'm headed over to WA in less than a month and uh, I'm going to go dive with Bert Calder, the old man blue, and we're gonna. I'm going to... I'm planning to just have a nice little break. Got 10 days over there, and I'm going to go spare him. But for now, let's get into today's interview. Derek Marshall Dunning, DMD Fins on Insta. Here we go. Today's Noob Spare Podcast is proudly brought to you in partnership with Adreno Spearfishing Supplies. For your next piece of spearfishing equipment, head to adreno.com.au. Flat rate shipping, Australia-wide, huge range of gear. Save $20 on every purchase over $200 when you use the code Noob Spiro. Better yet, drop into their Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne or Perth mega stores. Use the code Noob Spiro to save online or in store. Check it out, adreno.com.au. Today's Noob Spiro podcast is brought to you by Neptonics.com. For US divers, Neptonics is the one-stop shop for all of your spearfishing essentials. They've got free shipping on every order over $99. Now you can use the Noob10 code to save 10% off anything and everything store-wide. 10% off store-wide. Use the code Noob10 at Neptonics.com. Boom. Well, um, welcome to the podcast DMD Derek Marshall Dunning, it's a it's a long name. How can you use your middle name in your um in your stuff? Has there been a long line of Derek Dunnings? No, 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 not at all. It's just that's what I'm when I was born. My mother, my, that's my mother's maiden surname. So I was given. I think it's an old school thing that people used to do, and that's just how it is. I'm Derek Marshall Dunning. Yeah, nice. And um and DMD Fins. I uh, already chatting with you a bit about before. Before the show, before we got on, you've started making these carbon fiber fins. Some of the designs that you've got on your Instagram page, I think, is it DMD fins? It is DMD fins. Yeah, yeah DMD fins on Instagram. It's a couple of like really cool designs um, that we were chatting about. Yeah, I um, I liked I, I like seeing what you're doing there. So, um, welcome to the show. You've been competing for a long time in South Africa. You've sort of um, been in the the, the spearfishing club scene there. You, it, it, it seems like you've been involved in spearfishing in South Africa for a long time. I'm not actually. Um, believe it or not, I've only been doing it for about 10 years. Um, I haven't got those stories where I started out when my father was doing it and all that other thing. I actually started out when I think I was 10 years old and um, living in Funabel Park, which is like inland, far away from the sea. And my old man for my Christmas bought me a moss snorkel and fins and one of those big, you know, those massive dive knives with a hammer on the back that, I mean, a 10-year-old shouldn't actually have. And that's how I actually got into the water. I used to get into the public pool, snorkeled around there. Um, I, uh, I was cheap as chips to get in there at the time. And um, I used to get into the public pool, go into the diving pool, and I'd spend the day diving up money that was lost from the diving platforms, watches and all that. And that's how I actually started snorkeling. And, yeah, that's how I started. Was free diving natural to you? Like, I remember when I was young, like, I started in a dive pool as well in the summer. And um, my parents would buy us season tickets for the swimming pool, and it was quite expensive. But because there were three boys, and I'd be diving down into this dive pool. I think it was three point eight or four meters deep, and uh, and that was kind of how I learned how to free dive just by myself training on the bottom of this dive pool. And I'd do kind of the same as you. And every year it'd take me like two weeks for my ears to um, get used to or become acclimatized to not equalizing at that depth all the time because I wasn't equalizing at all. Did you do anything similar? Not really. I was just shitter. I was. I wasn't <laughs> great. I was, I'm definitely not a natural. I've had to work a bit. And um, yeah, I'm, I've, regarding ears, I can talk to you about for weeks with ears. I've got my one, one left ear is sticky, and I've always struggled with that. But um, yeah, I know what happened was we ended up moving down to Richards Bay, which is on the east, the east coast, and um, I got in the water there and I was snorkeling around. And I actually then I was I really had this intention of trying to get into spear fishing, and um, I never got around to. I never got the opportunity. And I started then, I was just snorkeling around the harbour and catching little tropical marine fish for fish tanks. And from there, we moved down to Cape Town. And um, I think I was out of the water for about 10 years. I just decided I'm not going to get in the water here. It's just too cold. So I never bothered getting back in the water until an old man um, came in and he gave me a whole lot of diving gear. And it was like scuba gear. And it was a pair of the scuba um, snorkeling fins or fins and um, 
bright yellow ones. And then the cape, we call anything yellow, yum, yum, yellow. Because it's <laughs> um, the, something the great whites might like. <laughs> Is that anecdotal? Is that bro science? Or is that like a, do you think there's some legitimacy to that yum yum yellow? I think anything bright might just get us attention. So um, that's why I like to dive in a camouflage wetsuit and I try to hide. Um, yeah, so um, I got, I actually ended up getting back in the water in the Cape. Um, it's actually quite, not sad, but I um, knew a couple of guys that actually poached crayfish, which is the West Coast rock lobster. And I actually got back in the water after 10 years poaching crayfish. That's what I did. It wasn't, there was nothing to be proud of, but um, it was just the way I ended up getting back in the water. And eventually I realized that, you know what, this, this is like having another job and I already had a job and this is not what I wanted to do. And I got my first spear gun. And um, in between trying to poach crayfish, I tried to shoot a fish and I was just shit. I am really bad. I had no idea how to aim a gun. And um, I just decided that was it. I'm not going to do the crayfish thing anymore. And I was going to try and become a spear fisherman. So that's how it started. Wow. So you, you mentioned your, your ears. So you had, you've got a sticky left ear. Walk us through some of your equalizing um, history. Um, luckily now um, I've got a diving buddy who is ENT. So, you know, it's like now it's, if I need, to, I need drugs, I just send him a WhatsApp and he sends me a script and I just go to the chemist and say, I need this piece. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's just, it's always been sticky. Um, I've obviously, with time, I've learned how to equalize a bit better. And I've learned that, you know, drinking copious amount of beer before I go diving is not a good idea, um, unfortunately. So I've had to slow down on the drinking side. I've got lots of stories going drinking and diving and vomiting and throwing up in snorkels and cramping up at 25 meters. And there's just <laughs> lots of bad stories that I should never have done. But, um, yeah, no, my ears are a lot, a lot better now. Um, but the ENT mate of mine, he says he's, the only thing he can think of now is to put one of those balloons up your station tube and inflate it. But he says there's no, not much research on how effective it is. But at the moment, I've got to work around And I only really struggle if I'm doing proper depth. You know, it's normal diving. I'm fine, you know. So when you start to do mouth fill and stuff like that or? No, that's it's fine. It's just proper depth. You know, I just – it's always equalizes it's just a lot harder than you. i've got to blow like say like twice the amount of pressure to get it open versus the right hand one okay so maybe you know snot clap on my ear so do you slow down your descent do you do you turn your head to the side or do you, you know like what, what are your so like i've had that situation before where one of my ears isn't clearing and i'm i'm headed down the water column i'm pinching my nose and sometimes i'll twist my head to the side to try and get I don't know, it seems like maybe manipulate my eustachian tube so more, more one ear goes up one side than the other, but it, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. What, what's, your, what's your workaround when you get in these sticky situations? Well, if I really struggle with it, what I'll do is I'll equalise and I keep the pressure on and then I just keep topping it up so I don't actually let go of my nose. I just keep the pressure on, keep my eustachian tube open and that's how I'd normally get around it. But like I said, it's got better with time. Um, so it's not as bad as it used to be. A lot of guys get – sorry, we, we, we're, we're going quite in depth here with um, equalising and I'm, I'm not trying to bore you with it. I, I, I've noticed that there's kind of two schools of thought. Like a lot of people go down the surgical route or the, or the pharmacological route where we go down traditional um, ENT, Western medicine practice, which is either we do surgery or we give people drugs, basically. But then there's there's another sort of school that's coming along, like Adam Stern. I don't know if you've seen some of his videos where mm -hmm. he, he, he's all about, like, um, opening them up through a series of exercises and stuff like that. Um, have you explored both sort of pathways or um, what's been your experience with it? I have been doing some um – Eustachian tubicle and exercise. I've, I have started doing that as well, but I've definitely done the drug side. I can throw you dead with cortisone. Um, I always carry cortisone with me. Um, I've got antihistamines in case of sinuses. I, um, I'll probably have to say I'm a bit more of a druggie. Okay. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and we've always got cortisone with us. Okay. And and, and what, what's the administration of cortisone and how, how does it, does it affect your, like to some of the drugs they say can make you drowsy and all this sort of like antihistamines, particularly, I'm not sure about cortisone though. How do you administer it and what's, how effective is it and how does it work? Well, it definitely opens up the reduced inflammation. Um, I'll normally, like if I'm worried that I need to be able to dive, um, like so now we do a free diving course and I'm, then when we do our free diving courses, we dive every dive with our students. And if I'm worried that I might be a bit sticky, I'll pop a couple of pulls at night and then a couple of pulls in the morning. It doesn't affect me. I mean, I think I'm so used to this stuff now, but it definitely helps. Um, I try not to use it all the time because it has got some, it's not good for you, but 
in the event that I'm just worried that I can't equalize and I need to be able to dive with my students or I need to, I'm going somewhere where I want to have a good spearfishing trip, I'll take it because I've gone on trips where I haven't done anything wrong with my sinuses, I haven't drank, and then I get in the water and my first dive I can't equalize and then I've got to get back on the boat, snort salt water and get them open. Yeah, It yeah. normally comes right, so. The snorting the salt water is an old, old trick. I actually learned that from a South African as well. Shout out to Dondre. Um, and, and I started doing that as well when I got stuck, particularly like with the mild flu and stuff. Um, so you're, you're an instructor. You're a Naui instructor. Um, how often are you teaching courses? And, and uh, I actually had a good look at one of your courses, that one of the outlines actually, and had a, had a good play with it because you don't just teach freediving like a lot of instructors do. You actually teach stuff for um, spearfishing and collecting as well. Yeah, well, you know, the thing is, I've been doing it with my a very good friend of mine, Matt, that I actually met through the spearfishing fraternity, or not even the spearfishing fraternity, I met him through um, doing a course. The thing is, we are spearfishermen. I mean, we're competitive spearfishermen. We've both dived for our province, and um, our background is spearfishing. So, you know, I mean, it's just crossing the bridge. I mean, we ended up becoming free dive instructors, but, I mean, a lot of guys um, um, know me in the Cape and that, and... Um, it's just that a lot of guys want to know how to spearfish. I mean, how to hunt and all the rest of it. So we actually put a course together um, due to people actually asking us for it. And um, the nice thing is we actually do the whole course where we go, we do the we do training with them. We take them in, the, in, in a rock pool or a pool and we let them fire up all the different types of guns, inverted rollers and all the rest of it. And then we actually take them out hunting. And after the hunting, we come out and whatever they've shot, we actually teach them how to fillet it on the side and we actually get them to bry it. I think you call it barbecue. Yeah, bry. And then we, I mean, they eat the fish. And um, we always take uh, some sausage, some, we call it borscht. We take some borscht with his backup just in case we shoot nothing. So we at least bry something. But um, the feedback on it's been very good. So it's like the full package. We take them into the water. We get them to hunt. They get them to catch. They get them to clean. And they get them to eat their fish. So um, it's been good. It's been, and the thing is also with our free diving courses, we, Tell everybody, I mean, on the course, we actually explain, this is what you do in free diving. You know, I mean, we teach to be um, a neutrally buoyant 10 meters and all the rest of it. But obviously, in the Cape, a lot of the diving, the guys are diving shallower. I and mean, you can't be neutrally buoyant at 10. So we've done put on more weight. And we adjust the course accordingly just to accommodate spearfishing. Yeah, like that, that, is, a, that is a massive thing that, that, that free diving instructors teach. And if you're, if you're hunting and gathering predominantly in – in uh, say like 15 meters, uh, sorry, 15 feet or something like that, you, you actually want to be negatively buoyant on the bottom because if you're having to hold yourself down or take like quarter breaths or whatever just to be able to hunt effectively, like it's a waste of effort and you spook fish and you, you know, like it's just clumsy. Like we've all been underweighted and that's a, it's a terrible problem. Yeah, that's also I mean, but one thing we've been teaching is not being overweighted because a lot of the divers you love to be overweighted, which is obviously a bit dangerous, so... When does overweighting become a problem? At what depth? Well, I mean, obviously it depends. I mean, we've got a lot of guys here that will dive. Like I obviously, if I'm diving deeper, I reduce weight to my weight belt. Um, but you've got a lot of the guys here that have got a weight belt set in stone. This is it. And they used to dive. They'll dive with that in five meters of water. They'll dive with it in 20 meters of water. And obviously, you know, at depth, you get compressed and you start to sink a lot faster. And you've got to get that back up. Mm, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, when you enter a sink phase, like you do some free dive training, you you know you, you look up from twenty five meters down. Your your buoyancy needs to be on point. Um, if you're having to work too hard, and you, you know you're already um, you know it's it's not a great place to be. And so with your with with weight belts, with your students' weight belts, are you teaching them to put um, weights on where they can uh, like um, say have a couple of fixed weights and then have a couple of variable like slip on weights? Or what's your system for uh, making sure people are properly weighted in their diving context? Well, in, the, in South Africa, we've got two types of weight. We've got the slip-on weights. We've also got the quick-release weights, um, the Rob Allen and then make. And um, I don't really care which way they do it as long as the weights can be taken off because we've got one of the local suppliers here. You walk into him and he looks at you and he says, how much do you weigh? And you say, I'm 110 kilos. And he goes, you need 11 kilos of lead and he hammers into place, which I don't, I don't really agree with. But, you know, so we make sure the divers can remove the weights and adjust them accordingly. Another mistake people make is they get their, their their rubber weight belts and they might be diving like warm water and they have their three mil wetsuit on and then they go down to somewhere like Cape Town where you want at least a five mil, possibly a seven mil, and then uh, all of a sudden you've cut the end of your weight belt off because you think, oh, I've got too much uh, too much uh, belt left over, I'll chop it off, and then you get down in the cold water, want to add a couple of weights on, you've got no weight belt, nowhere to go with it, so you've got to buy a new one. Uh, we normally dive in a five mil in the Cape. Um, I can survive in a five mil. It depends. I mean, sometimes it's actually quite warm, but generally it's not that great. And um, but some some folks start with a seven mil. 
I um I watched a television interview with you. Uh, I think it was uh, it was like a, a Cape Town sporting type interview, and uh, the guy asked you to explain spearfishing, and you were guilty of a of, a, of an old sort of um, it's something that a lot of us are. When you become very competent at something, you f- almost forget what you've learned, and you um you know like he was like how do you spearfish and, and you explained it like really simply and and I thought you were just typical of a person that's um become very good at what you do but you almost had forgotten all of those learning blocks it sounds though like now you've come full circle I mean teaching courses you must realize like how much is actually involved in the learning journey of uh to become good at hunting oh <laughs> Well, yeah, the interview was sorry um, to pick uh, on you <laughs> no, no 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 it's fine that was um that was on that was on our um, it was broadcast on DSTV and um, yeah, um, I think let's go this way. I, I can be quite arrogant. I mean, it's just part of my personality. I'll blame on being Scottish. And, <laughs> um, but I found that it's actually doing the free diving course is actually very good for me. It's actually taught me a lot, bit of, uh, quite a bit of patience, um, obviously, because now you've got to realize that you know, a five meter dive for you is chalk and cheese and there's chips and it's easy and all the rest of it but for some guys it's actually quite challenging and the way it's actually panned out like i said me and myself and matt so have been doing these courses together and um me being the hard ass arrogant one it just worked out that now i'm the one who's actually when people struggle i actually take them aside and i work on people that will be struggling with the equalization so obviously i understand equalization a lot better than matt because he doesn't struggle with it and he carries on with the course. So it works out It works out very well that the course never stops. He can carry on with the students that are doing all right. And I actually sit to the side and we actually work on the ones that I work on, the ones that have been struggling a bit. And yeah, it's, it's been good because we don't turn anybody away. And what we do is if somebody can't qualify for whatever reason, they just come back on our next course. There's no additional charges. They just come back, they fall in again. And what we also do is whenever we have another course, we invite any of our previous students back. And we set up a separate line and we let them dive and carry on. So if we go back to Johannesburg, same story. We invite some of the Joburg guys back. They're welcome to come back. You know, because obviously the more they do things, the easier it becomes and the more um, permanent it becomes in the back of their mind. So it's been good. Um, I think it's, the free diving courses have definitely done me some good. It's like made me calm down a little bit. And, um, yeah, I would just say it's been good. <laughs> uh, good. That's awesome. I, I, I learned how to teach English like as a foreign language and teaching someone – you know, where English isn't their foreign language, obviously, you know, relatively simple tasks. You have to learn like, oh, wow, there's like, you know, there's these four building blocks I need to teach them in order to get to just creating one simple sentence. And I think with spearfishing, it's like that too. Sometimes, you know, like, oh, you go, oh, you just duck dive. And then you get to the bottom and you start hunting and it's like, okay, well, how do you duck dive? And, you know, like when you want to break a duck dive down into in, into all its component bits, I mean, you can get, Freediver obsessed with it, but even to do it to a fairly effective level where you're spearfishing and not spooking all the fish, there's actually quite a lot of micro skills involved in that. Um, with your students, so, so you mentioned equalising, you'll quite often take them aside and have one on ones. Um, what are some of the common problems that you see consistently with students when you run these courses, and how do you sort of help them tackle them? Um, most of the problems we actually had, well, not problems, it's not fair to say, issues is actually. Um We've done a lot of scuba divers, um, especially up in Johannesburg. And we always, before the course, you ask them, do you have any equalization issues and things like that? And they're always like, no, 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 no. But what they forget is they are normally on scuba. So they go down and they have a sticky ear. They just level out, they equalize, go down. They take their time. They don't realize with spearfishing, freediving, you're going to be going up and down the whole day. And um, so normally we find a lot of our students actually struggle with equalization, just sticky ears because they're not used to doing it and trying to get them to understand you must equalize often. Don't wait till you get, feel the pressure. Don't wait till it hurts. And so I'd say the biggest thing is just they need to learn to equalize often. But most of them are right. I mean, it's just that whole mentality that they don't have problems because they can, they've got a big tank on their back and they take their time. And we've also found that with the scuba divers, um, some of them are, I mean, the exceptional scuba divers, they dive in 60 plus meters in caves up in Johannesburg, but take the regulator away and then they struggle to swim down five meters. You know, it's just just getting that mental side of it right with them, you know, getting the anxiety out of them that they, can, that they can understand that they can actually do it, you know. So, yeah, it's been fun. But um, normal equalization is just the scuba divers because they're not used to having to equalize often. I guess one other the the common things like every freediving instructor seems to get it and and podcast hosts as well. It's um how do I hold my breath for longer? Um, a lot of people seem to think there's going to be some magic technique. Um, how do you 
What, what's your um, standard answer towards how do I hold my breath longer? I have to say time in the water. And, I mean, you can obviously do your static tables and all the rest, but I don't personally enjoy doing that. Um, I think the best thing to do is time in the water, you know, practice. I mean, the more comfortable you are. The biggest thing is a lot of it is coming down to anxiety and stuff like that. I mean, if you can't relax, you can't hold your breath, you can't be calm. Um, but definitely I think time in the water. Do you think there's something towards uh, diving with people that are at a – at a sort of a greater comfort level than you or at a greater experience level than you? Like, and do you think that's a problem? Like if you'll say, like if you're relatively new, maybe you're diving 30 feet doing some shore diving and then all of a sudden you you head out with some uh, some guys that are really experienced and they're diving 60, 70 foot range. Do you think that's a good or a bad thing? How do people sort of, uh, what, what cautionary um, advice would you give them? Um. I do say this. I mean, I actually say this quite often. Is you know, if, if you're diving, say so a couple of you guys are diving, you're, you're diving ten meters, um, and you're only ever going to dive 10, 10 meters. You know, what I mean, you're going to get to that spot where it's ten meters, and you're never going to actually improve. You're never going to evolve. And so, I do say diving with a stronger diver is going to help, but also you can't expect a guy who can only dive ten meters. You can't exactly go and drop him the twenty meter mark and expect him to dive it safely. So, there's obviously the safety concerns, but I do believe that. Um, if you can dive with a stronger diver, um, a more knowledgeable diver, it will definitely help you out. But obviously, within limits, you don't take him where you can't survive. Yeah, yeah. The problem is, is the the new guys aren't the ones that control some of those situations. It's the more experienced divers, and some people don't even realise they're sort of being can be a little bit reckless at times. You know, like, um, yeah. But anyway, um. Memorable fish, Derek. Uh, South Africa, you've got you've got a whole bunch of unique species that uh, that aren't that common in other parts of the world. Um, but for you, like, what's a fish you really love to hunt? And uh, I'd love to hear a story of a of a successful hunt. Um, oh, oh, there's quite a few fish on that side. Um, but I think personally, my favourite fish to hunt is the mussel cracker. Um, it's a quite a big white, solid, solid fish. And it likes to be in the white water. Um, yeah, I can, well, with me, with the thing is, I am um, up until the point I'd ever shot one. I um, I'd seen them, you know, they're quite spooky, and um, you go be quite quick on the trigger with them. And like I say, you're lying in white water, so you can normally get knocked around. So it's very difficult to lie still. In that. And um, I went on a trip once with a couple of mates of mine. I went up to a place called Arneson. I went off a reef called Saxon Reef, and this is before I ever shot one. And I was lying there, and I, like you got to lie in a gully, and hopefully they come in, and hopefully you're facing the right way. Nine out of ten times they come up behind you. And by the time you've managed to turn around, they're gone. And um, I dived there the one weekend, and I was lying in this gully, and I saw this big muscle cracker. It dropped into the gully, and I never got a shot on it. I was like, shit. And um, I think the next weekend we went back there and then we were diving. And I said to the guy whose boat was, I said, was Steve, and I said to Steve, you take me back there. And I literally swam straight into that same gully. Cause now I saw this cracker the week before and, I, and this is the spot. And true as God, here comes another one. And I took a shot at it and I put it in his belly and it pulled, pulled line off me on reel and um, I lost it. So I was very upset about that. And then I went back into the same crack. And then I shot my first muscle cracker and it was like, I mean, uh, it has to be 60 centimeters to be legally sized. And um, this thing was just size. Oh. But I was like, I was like super happy. I mean, I swam to the boat and I threw this thing on the boat and I looked at Steve and I said, I love you, man. And I was so <laughs> stoked. <laughs> and um, yeah, so then I went back into the same hole and I lay in the same hole and I got a bigger one. So um, that's definitely the fish I enjoy. I mean, they're not always difficult to shoot. If you get them in deeper water, which sometimes happens, then they're, and if you're big schools, then they're not so bad. But they're they're quite clever fish. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so I think definitely, and it's an awesome eating fish. I, that's probably my favorite eating fish. Um, well, the way, favorite way to do that is we'll take the whole fish. I mean, they're quite big if you shoot a decent one at least. And um, we just take the guts out and we coat it in salt and we put it on the brine. We basically cake it in salt and it cooks inside the salt and you take a hammer and you break it open. And it's just, you break open the skin. It's just the steaming meat of, you know, and the people devour it. It's, uh, when we talk about recipes, I've got a couple of good recipes for you. Cool. Well, that, I might have to send you a link to submit a recipe. Um, by the time this podcast goes live, though, I'd encourage everyone actually to do it. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but I'm working on a, a book um, with recipes from the spearfishing community called 99 Spear Recipes. So it's um, noobspearer.com forward slash. Brandon didn't mention it to me. Oh, did he? It's noobspearer.com uh, forward slash uh, submit recipe. So um, anyone's welcome to submit it, but I'd love to get your one for that. That sounds awesome all on its own. 
No, we actually got to I'll give you another. I'm getting sidetracked now. I'll give you another recipe. Another guy I know, he did some yellowtail. I think you use what you call a yellowtail kingfish. And um, I've, I've, I don't actually eat a lot of fish, believe it or not. I do a lot of spearfishing, I only a lot of fish. And um, that recipe he gave me was deadly. It was, I mean, it was seriously proper. And um, I made it for my wife's family the other day. And I took a photo as I put it on the table. And then I took a photo six minutes later and it was all gone. So, yeah, nice. Um, I'm that type of guy that, um, sadly, I mean, <laughs> like I've had my wife's family over and I do the whole seafood thing and I've got the crayfish, the West Coast rock lobster, and I've got seafood and I've got mussels and all this, and I do all this for them. And they sit down and eat it, and then I go bry a lamb chop and have lamb. <laughs> oh, wow. There's a few people like that, but um, I think part of the joy of spearfishing, though, is definitely feeding others and, um, yeah, like learning how to cook, even if you've got, like a lot of spearers have got three or four recipes, their go-tos that they're really good at. And then outside of that, it's kind of like, oh, no, that's outside of my wheelhouse. And learning new recipes sometimes takes a little bit of effort. So hopefully with this book, it'll just open um, open people up to some of the possibilities because um, I don't really want like really elaborate recipes that are, take too much time because at the end of a spearfishing day, I don't really want to – I don't feel like cooking something too elaborate. No, uh, well, like I said, I've got a, quite a few recipes we actually share. I mean, a lot of the guys will share. Like one of my other favorites is yellowtail kebabs, where Ooh. you just take, there needs to be a decent yellowtail, but you get nice blocks of yellowtail and you put on a kebab with the red peppers, green peppers, onions, mushrooms, and then we baste it in a thing called inner palmins, but any honey mustard basting, and you put it on the brine and it's quick and easy. I mean, people that don't eat fish eat that because it looks like chicken. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah, because you like. Uh, yellowtail would probably suit that, like, because you're not really overcooking it. It's just a quick, like, you're just really uh, getting a bit of colour on it and then away you go. Quick, quick. Yeah, I like it. That's a good one too. Jeepers, for a man that doesn't eat a lot of fish, you got a couple of good recipes there. I've got good friends there. <laughs> Are you in the market for a new spear gun? Killshot Spear Guns has got blue water wahoo tuna guns, open track spear guns, enclosed track spear guns, rear handle enclosed tracks. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com. Even better, I've got some good news for you. You can save $30 on any Killshot Spear Gun at killshotspearguns.com. Use the code NOOB. If you're in store, just say, crikey, mate. Or say Shrek from the Noob Spiro sent you and you'll save $30. Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. Check him out. Oldmanblue.com.au. You can't cheat experience. You can't fake passion. And damn, Old Man Blue can make gear that will last and stand the test of time. Check it out at Old Man Blue Dive on Instagram. Um, I was going to go back to your, your muskrat story. So, like, a lot of... Spiros that get good at free diving, um, well, you know, as we think about freedom, you know, like they can, you know, they're starting to hunt beyond 60 feet. They seem to forget the, the merits of hunting in the shallows sometimes. And they forget all the hard knock lessons that you learn in the shallows because there's, there's, a, there's a lot to learn. Like hunting's harder in the shallows in, in a lot of respects. The fish aren't forgiving at all about noise and motion and all the rest of it. No, they're a lot more skittish. And also, I mean, where I dive in the Cape, um, if I was to go dive deep, I mean, like where I live right now, I've got to drive 100 kilometers any direction just to get to the sea. That's roughly what it's going to take. And um, But a lot of our diving in the Cape isn't deep. Um, there's not a lot of fish in False Bay. I mean, we'll normally drive 200 odd kilometers up to Strays by in the summer to go dive the Yellowtail. So we do a lot of road trips to get fish. And I mean, even there, the Yellowtail like to be on the banks, and the one bank that starts at 13. You know, that's the top of depth you're going to be diving down to 25. So I mean, we don't have to do a lot of deep diving. And also, I've been asked that for some of our students, how deep do I dive to spearfish? And I'm like, I dive as deep as I need to. Because, I mean, anybody that knows, I mean, if you're on the, I mean, to be safe diving, if you're on the surface, for, like, on the bottom for two minutes, you've got to be on the surface for a set out four minutes to be safe. You know, so then if, you, if you're doing dives, you're doing 10 dives an hour if you want to be safe. But if you're only diving a minute dive to 10 meters, you do two minute recovery. So you're diving 20 dives an hour. So where do you want to shoot fish? I mean, you shoot fish on the bottom. So I dive wherever I've got to dive to shoot fish. So if the reef's 10 meters, I'll dive. I mean, if I'm going to dive deeper, I want to actually get fish on it. So we don't dive that deep yeah, unless we have to. Yeah. Has, has competitive spearfishing sort of helped you with that mindset as well? Because like, no one cares how deep you dive in a comp. They, they, they really care about what you put 
on the scales at the end of the of the of the of the comp day, I guess. No, it's your work rate. I mean, you can. I mean, you've got to work as fast as you can and safer. Obviously, you've got to take the safety into it. So yeah, I mean, it depends. Also, it depends where they hold the competitions. I mean, we hold our competitions every year. It gets held at a different location. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, we haven't been able to have it for the last two years. And um, but it's supposed to be in P in Port Elizabeth. You can shoot fish in five meters of water down to like fifty meters of water. So you know you've got to just work the area that you're given. Um, so yeah, I, I'll dive. I mean, like I said, if we go dive now, we'll probably dive the weekend in False Bay. We'll be diving probably average fifteen, max twenty meters. That's the depth we're going to work. You know. So. Tell us a little bit about your conditions there. So, like water temps, um, is it is the Atlantic is it nutrient rich? Like um, False Bay obviously provides a bit of protection there from some of the conditions. Does it provide you protection from the trade winds? Um, yeah, generally speaking, because of the shape of the bay, we're generally always going to have somewhere we can jump in. Um, you know, depending on which way the wind, if the southwest swell is going, we can normally jump inside the bay on what we call Miller's caravan side um southeast you know we can jump in on the other side so there's always somewhere you can get in unfortunately the fish life is not that great um you'd expect a lot more um i mean one of the most common fish we've got here is called the cape green aka horton top and um majority of the spears when they start out that's the first fish they're gonna shoot um she shoot shoot because shoot, 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 <laughs> there's plenty of them and um yeah it's and um, you'd expect more life and um the sad thing is we've got a lot of reserves in Cape Town and around Cape Town. So you'd expect a lot more than what there is, but uh, I think it's just come down to overfishing it. Um, so yeah, so I mean, we want to go shoot proper fish, we travel. So False Bay, I guess it's sort of guilty of what a lot of bays are. It serves as a sort of a, a nurturing zone for a lot of um, uh, immature fish and stuff like that, but sometimes it lacks the um, the uh, the prestige of some of the bigger, more mature species that sort of seem to want to head offshore. Would that be fair? Yeah, I mean, you can get some big fish, but generally, like, they'll get the cob, I think, what would you call it? Mulloway. Like Jewfish. Yeah, the yeah, Mulloway, yeah. Yep. And um, you can get them there, but they're generally on the side called Bamakasa, which is a beach, and it's normally always dirty. And unfortunately, you know, there's the chance of running into a great white in Falls Bay, so, you know, you don't want to take unnecessary risks and dive in shit water. Okay. But our visibility, I mean, if we get a good day, we've got five meters, that's a good day. I must admit, about a month back, we had exceptional vis for False Bay. I mean, it was stupid. I mean, we had like 25 plus meter vis in False Bay, which I've never seen before. But even with that being said, it wasn't very fishy. So, you know, but you could explore a new reef, which is awesome. We spent the whole weekend or yeah, the weekend just running around and we're like literally riding on the boat going, oh, there's a reef. Let's jump and see what's down there. So <laughs> yeah. that, that was quite fun. But um, yeah, unfortunately, like I say, if we want proper decent class fish, we travel. Um, this time of year, winter, the yellowtail come past Cape Point um, and they get them at Dustin Island, which is up the west coast. And um, then summer months, we go straight by Arnis and that side. We go right around the other side. I mean, we'll drive for four hours in the morning just to go spearfish. But that's the nice thing about the sport. I mean, the minute I get in the car with my friends, I don't care about anything else. Um, we talk the biggest load of shit. <laughs> and we have a jaw and the fit to me the fish is just a bad it's actually a bonus i mean i don't really care if i get fish um i just have a great day with my friends how long did it take to you to get that mindset we have you always been like that or is that um i think when i started out obviously when you start out you it's always like a dick swing competition you know so you want to shoot the most fish and you want to come out with your quote of 10 fish for the day um, but I think now it's now it's more a case of, you know, I'd rather go and have a good day with my friends. If I see a decent fish, um, I'll shoot it. Um, like the other day we went out and I had a really great dive. There was loads of fish life, and a lot of juveniles. And I spent most of the time just filming it with my GoPro on the front of my gun. Um, so, yeah, there's a saying, catch, what's it? Shoot your catch, not your quota. So um, I think as I've got older now, it's not such a big thing of getting my whole um, bag full of fish. Um if I see one or two decent class fish, I'll take them. And obviously, competition is a different story. Then you've got to just get your fish for the point system. But if it's just a normal dive, I shoot very well. I shoot a lot of fish. And there's a lot of fish like our national fish, which is a whole yun. I think it tastes like shit. I don't eat it. So I don't shoot it. So I'm, I mean, like the last weekend's dive, I shot two fish and I filmed loads of them. So. With that, Cape Brim, um, just to go back to like early, early days and then what a lot of the new guys are hunting. Um, are they good eating? 
depends who you ask. <laughs> and I don't like them. Um, a lot of people do actually like them. Um, it's quite a fishy fish. It's got a, quite a strong fish flavor. I've had it done. Um, if it's cooked for me, I mean, they make awesome fish bags. Um, but me personally, I don't like them. But I mean, a lot of guys do eat them. And a lot of guys like them. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's the staple go-to. Um, we also get butter fishy and things like that. But I mean, also the red roman, which is a quite a nice, that's a, that's a nice eating fish. Um, I enjoy eating them. That's one of the few fish I will shoot. Um, but yeah, I could just... So 80, 80% of sort of hunting sometimes seems to be more finding these fish. Um, how do the how do guys that are newer in your area, how do they find these fish and then how do they hunt them effectively? Pick one or the other, whether it's uh, Cape Brim or whether it's, yeah. Sometimes it's like, well, you find one, you find the other probably, I'm, I, yeah. Oh, well, Cape Bream is quite prolific. I mean, you get Cape Bream everywhere. I mean, both sides. Like if you go table view side on, that's where the harbour is. There's not much fish life there at all other than Cape Bream. Um, so that's, I wouldn't even use it as a I mean, that you just swim and you'll find them. Uh, Red Roman, um, what I find with the Red Roman is generally they like to be a bit deeper water. And when I say deeper, I'm talking about like 10 metres plus. And um, generally, if you're swimming around, you'll see we get these orange sponges on the on the reef. And if you come across some of those orange sponges, you'll normally find a couple of red romans. And also, if you see a couple of small red romans, there's always bigger ones in the area. Um, there's always like a dominant male there somewhere. So, yeah, I mean, those also they like to hide in holes. So that's a good fish to hunt with a torch because if they see you coming, they'll go and bolt into a hole and you need a torch to have a look for them. All right, cool. So the red roman, all right. Um, all right, what about toughest situation? Um, you've been you've been in the water spearing for a good 10 years, so... What's a situation that maybe scared the crap out of you and what did you learn from it? Well, I wouldn't say scared the crap out of me. I'm more, oh, what I did once was um, we went on a trip to Mozambique and um, Robert Morland, a friend of ours, um, he shot a big barracuda and um, he shouted for a second shot. So I'm like, okay, no, no big deal. And then I, I'd already just shot a fish, so I reloaded my gun. And you know sometimes you don't lock the spear back in and it comes out. So as I put the rubber on the gun, the spear slid out like that. So I'm like, okay, no problems. So I grabbed the spear in my hand and I thought I'm going to just swing down and stab this barracuda and get it on the spear for him. And um, I didn't realize at the time, the reason he was asking for a second shot was not because it was a bad, bad shot placement. It's because the fish will bite you. And um, I swam down towards this barracuda and he, Next thing I see this thing coming straight towards me and this thing bit me on my tit. Oy. And um, from there it proceeded to uh, uh, bit me on my tit. I've actually got it on my, on my Facebook page. Somewhere you'll see there's actually a wetsuit with a hole in my tit. Oh, wow. And um, it bit me. And then from there it took a go at his son and bit his son on the ankle and it bit him on the on the, on the on his weight belt. So um, that's when I realized that um, a barracuda, there's a reason they ask for a second shot is to kill the damn thing, not to actually um, get on the boat. So... Yeah, so that was interesting. Um, we've also done some stupid things. I mean, we went to nationals in Natal and we're very fortunate that they organized a boat for us there. And we had this big rubber duck and we launched the duck on the first day and we ran quite far down south and this thing was chewing through petrol. I don't know what the hell was wrong with this boat. It was like literally chewing. I think we ended up using about 150 liters of fuel on this duck and we had to get fuel brought to us and all the rest of it. But then we realized we forgot to put the bung plug in so the hole was full of water. So, you know, that was supposed to be the professional, or, well, I wouldn't say professional, but the, the, the Western Province A team, you know, the Western <laughs> Noble <thing. laughs> The humble pie day. Needless to say, I've got a big sticker on my little boat saying, bung in question mark now. So, but yeah, it's suck. We've done lots of stupid things. I mean, I've got, we went through a series of um, Matt being a dick, which is, the, I mentioned you, Matt. And, um, and uh, <laughs> It's like the one time we're diving and we're diving at Arnis and I come up with the yellow tail. That wasn't a big fish. It was probably like a three, four, five kilo class fish, but it was the, the that was the biggest one that, that swam past me. And um, we'd already put a couple of 10 kilo class fish on the boat. So I come up and I got this little fish on the surface and I'm busy and I just hear this voice behind me and Matt's filming me saying, Shane, man, put it back. I'm like, what the fuck? It's, it's, it's not a shot. <laughs> so that was part of Matt being a dick. And then um, <laughs> there's another video where I'm lining up on a fish about 20 meters of water and I've got my arm extended and this spear comes flying down from above my head and shoots the fish. And, <laughs> and, I look up and, there's Matt. and I go I'm like, what the fuck? So we had this series of Matt being a dick going, which was, it was actually quite fun. But like I said, I really enjoy I mean, I've got a group of friends and um, regarding the sport, I think – you meet a lot of guys. I mean, I, I, most of my friends, my current good mates, is actually people I would never met. Um, you know, like 
I met Matt and I met a couple of other guys doing this course. And the thing is, it's they, you never pass it, you never cross a lot of paths with them in life because he's like a professional photographer based in town and things like that. So I think with the sport, you actually meet a lot of interesting people and you make some really good, obviously with the nature of the sport, you become really good friends with them. So I, I really, I, if I take anything out of the sport, that's definitely the thing. You meet some really, really good people that I don't think you'd ever cross paths with. Yeah, yeah, different political views and religious beliefs and ways of looking at life and all that stuff. Well, most of my friends are just Muppets, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do they say, Lou? Like attracts like. They hundred <laughs> percent. I don't think there's many, many many sane spiros out there. I think they're all got a couple of screws looser. So yeah, hundred percent. I, I think they're all a bit mental somewhere down inside. Yeah, so, um, I'd agree with that. I was actually going to do an episode on that about how many of us have got a screw loose, but uh, it, it, it's part of what makes it so fun. Um, let's let's hook into Veterans Vault. So. DMD fins uh, on Instagram. You've been making fins for how long? Have you been making fins? Um, I think on on total, probably about three year, um, three years. But I've only started selling about a year ago. Um, I started uh, like I told you before the show. We um, I, another guy I met. Well, he is he is really a muppet. Um, <laughs> he told me he could make me a fin and it would look like this. And I went to him and he was trying to make it on the floor in his garage, and it came out like a plank. And I think that's where it got me started. And um, so I started playing around with the idea. Um, if anybody's seen my workshop, which is my garage, and um, they'll tell you that there's so many fins lying there. Obviously, as you try to learn what weight of glass, and I mean, I, I started doing fiberglass composites because obviously it was cheaper to make mistakes. Um, I could probably start a business selling fins to replace ceiling fan blades because I've got so many lying in the garage. <laughs> That'd actually be that's actually a good idea for a business. I'd buy a ceiling fan made out of fucking uh uh fins. fins. Yeah, that would be actually really cool. You could do that for sure. I'll buy one, I'll be your first customer. Uh, so yeah, so it's been a long process. I started out calling it Atlantic with an at symbol with a shark in it, and then I realized that's a bit porno. So I um, <laughs> I changed the name to my original, just to DMD. It's very straightforward, it's just my initials. And I think the logo works. And um, touch wood, the feedback on the pins has been good. I've obviously come a long way, um, made a lot of mistakes. I mean, there's not really much literature on the internet on how to make a fin. And the, the guys that know, they're not exactly going to tell you. So, um, but touch wood, the feedback's been good. I've started doing the carbons recently because um, I've got a lot more confidence in my process of manufacturing that. And um, yeah, so it's going well. Um, I do a lot of custom at the moment. Most of it's custom. I don't make blades. And I don't stock blades. The guy gets hold of me and he tells me he wants this picture on his blade. And he says, what can you put on the blade? And I'll say, listen, I can put anything you want on your blade. So, yeah, so happy. Yeah, cool. This is, there's a lot of old school divers in South Africa. There's a lot of old school mentalities around spearfishing. And spearos in general are a pretty old school bunch. Um, there, back in the day when there were forums for spearfishing, there was a lot of shit talk about fiberglass composites and and carbon fiber blades and and them not really providing much benefit to 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 spiros and i am an advocate for carbon fiber fins like i wear penetrator fins uh larry and penetrator sponsor the podcast i make no bones about it i absolutely love them i've had my set for, i don't know five years or whatever i really like I really like them. But there, there's an argument on the internet that persists, and, and there's some old spiros that still use plastics. They say that carbons and fiberglass composites don't confer much advantage. What's your response to that argument? Do you, do you bother to get into these conversations? Um, you know, I've, I've actually, what we've been doing is we've been collecting with our little um, studio where we do our free diving courses. I've actually been collecting old books and all, you know, just stuff from the old spearfishmen. And I've actually got some of the old fins that they used to dive with. And I mean, there's a short rubber jet fin and there's a longer one called the gold fin. And I don't know how the hell can like donkey, <laughs> you know, I don't, I do a lot of pool training with our club and my local club. And um, we let the guys try different blades and that. And I don't think, I mean, again, I suppose fin is like an arsehole one as own, um, but um, I think like a guy diving on the plastic blade, he doesn't know any better until he's actually dived with something better. And I mean, you know, it, there definitely is advantages over fiberglass over carbon. I mean, it comes back to the memory how quickly it snaps back into place and it gives you free thrust and all that stuff. So yeah, there's. I mean, personally, I do believe it. Um, I did a lot of training back in the day with a guy called Trevor Hutton, and he said plastic. I mean, he did 60 meter plus with plastic, and 
you know, he, he got sponsored a pair of blades and he didn't want to use them, which were carbon. He actually stuck stickers on the plastic blade to make it look like he was using the carbon blade when he did his photos and things like that. And um, part of our training here we did with him, he said to me, no, we had to put two-way belts on and we had to go down like, I think it was 12, 14 meters. And we had to try swim those blades, uh, swim back up with two guys' weight belts on because he wanted to prove to us that plastics are more efficient. But we got back up with our blades. So, you know, I, I do believe that some guys die with like way too hard blades. I mean, that's why I've got a friend of mine and he came into the garage and he's old school, one of those typical old school guys who's been diving for 50 years and he's used to these hard plastics. And he came into the garage and he picked up a pair of these blades that I made back in the days that I was still learning. And they're like planks. And he said to me, no, these are perfect for them. I said, no, 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 they're way too hard. He says, no, they're perfect for them. This is what you want. I said, oh, they, they, they look like shit. There was like one of my trial things. And I just kind of fixed them up for him, <laughs> gave them to him. And he dived with them for about a year. And he came back to me after about a year. And he said, no, he agrees with me now. Those blades are too hard because he gets too tired. I said, I fucking told you. You know, but it's that old school mentality. <laughs> Listen, I've been very fortunate. I've been able to be surrounded by some of the really old spear fishermen, like Tommy Burta and that. Yeah. And um, if you see what they did, I mean, the di- the depths they dived, the fish they shot with the equipment they used, uh, you know, I mean, that's why I, on your one, I think it was on your Instagram where you said, you know, what's the one mistake you made? And I do believe that it's going out and buying the fanciest, most expensive gear. You know, I mean, these old guys could dive circles around you. They'll probably still dive circles around you using plastic fins. But the thing is, they know how to dive, Yeah, you know. I mean, I was a gear slut. There's no other word for it. I was a gear slut. I would go and buy, well, you probably know the brand Rabitech. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, Is that local road, to you? you know, Rabitech. Uh, he's literally, he's down the road. Yeah, I'd yeah, go yeah. there almost every yeah. second day yeah. and pop in there. And I was, when I started out, I was literally a gear slut. I mean, I, I, at one stage, I had a revolving, I wouldn't say credit, but I didn't even check what I owed him. Every month, I just paid him a thousand rand, you know, and I just <laughs> walk into something new and I take it and I walk out with it. <laughs> It was, you know, it, it, well, the only thing that stopped that is when I was I had to save up to get married. And then I kind of <laughs> thought, okay, you know. Uh, and, but every time he got something new, it's like, oh, that's nice. I must have that. Oh, these are nice. You know, and the thing is, it's, I realized that, you know, it doesn't make, I mean, yes, it does the it, it, better equipment does have its advantages, but I mean, you got to learn the basics first, though, 100%. And that's what I like about our club. And we get down to the pool. I'll be there tonight again. And, and we get down to the pool and there's other new guys that pull in there and we try to help them. It's about making it the sport safe. You know, you get a guy who comes down there and he, I mean, you'll go to a spearfishing shop, he spends 10 grand, he buys all the kit and he goes and jumps in the sea and he's clueless. So, I mean, we do a lot of training with the guys, which is awesome. That's why I was talking to you about your course too, because I think there's a real demand for it in the spearfishing community. It's um, And there are a few courses getting around, you know, like um, Eckhart, who you know in Melbourne, he he teaches spearfishing courses. Uh, you've got Simon Tripp in Sydney. There's a couple of these guys, um, and, and I'm hoping a few girls are going to come through that are starting to teach these particularly spearfishing courses, freediving courses or, or for spearfishing though, or, or just straight spearfishing courses because um, – you can do everything the hard way, and you can. You can learn all the shit the hard way. You can do it. But i tell you what, you know, you can go and do a course and you can save yourself five fruitless days where you're not only, you know, ineffective and not shooting anything and cold and miserable and using shit technique and probably in a heightened level of risk, or you can just go and do a course and you can learn half of the stuff. And you still got to learn everything the hard way, but you've got someone there to walk you through. And one day it's just, I don't know, I think it can make a world of difference in, um, in people's learning curves, that's for sure. No, 100%. I mean, it gives you a lot of baseline. I mean, the things that it took you years to learn, you can actually tell the guy sitting around a table. And um, I mean, our spearfishing course is that comprehensive that when we drive back, we actually show you all the local stops where you got to stop. Like, we've got this one place on the way back from Millers, we've got to stop at. It's a little shop. They do the best samosas. You know, <laughs> little Indian samosas. So it's like, we go there. This is where we stop for our samosas. And this is where we stop for a burger and a beer. So, <laughs> are we, you know, we, we've got like, we've got like set routines. And the thing is, I mean, I learned a lot. Of, I did a lot of stupid things when I started out. And um, um, what we've also found, well, not all found, one of the things in the Cape is we've got, we had, two really big spearfishing clubs and they've slowly died away. And that's because the older guys, um, they didn't really pass on their knowledge and then they stopped spearfishing and they are the clubs, just both those clubs, they're, they're physical clubs that actually got um, buildings and the spearfishing fraternities died down. And the thing is, 
I would rather, I mean, I'm not that young anymore, but I'd rather when I'm done and dusted, I'd rather be able to sit back and say, you know, I helped that life. Yeah, you're doing so well. I'd rather be known as somebody that actually helped than um, somebody who just sat back and didn't do anything, didn't help the people. Um, so, you know, I'm not the best spear fisherman in the world, um, but I like to be able to give back. And like I say, you get down to the, the pool and we talk a lot of crap off the training and tell them all the stupid things you've done. And then you hear some of the stories of the lifeies. I mean, the one guy, He's just started out, and so far he's lost. I think what did he lose? He had to drop his weight belt the other day because he got tangled in his own line. He lost his mask. He lost his fin, but he got his fin back because he used those cheap ones that float, so it floated back to him. And that was within, I think, two weekends of spearfishing, and he's just started out. So, you know, a simple thing like a fin guard is a fantastic thing. Use a fin guard, you won't lose your fin. So it's, I enjoy that. I, I enjoy sitting there trying to help the guys. Um, and like I said, with our club, we're very fortunate. We've got a lot, of, a lot of the new guys coming into our club, um, which is great. And um, we do, like I said, we do our pool training. And we have the guys in the water. We teach them as much as we can. We teach them a bit more about safety, you know, hook breaths and all the rest of it. And then, so they actually don't go into the water. And Fuzzy, the old chairman of our club, I'm the current chairman, he actually takes them down to the sea and takes a crowd of these lighties into the water with them. And obviously they don't shoot a lot of fish because there's like 10 of them, you know, swarming around the same reef. But it's good. It's um, it's, I've had I've really enjoyed that. Um, and yeah, I mean, some of our club compies. We have a club compi in November, which is our crayfish competition. It's the first weekend of the crayfish competition. We have, I think, the most we've had is 150 divers. Compies. Wow, that's pretty cool. And it's just, it's it's, it's a big. I mean, it's it's a, it's a competition, but it's not a very competitive competition. The biggest four crayfish wins the bag. And um, we have a draw there. There's a lot of drinking that goes on afterwards. And it's just as we call it chies, which is I mean like party. Um, chies, I think it's Afrikaans word, and it's it's just a good jaw. And um, I always encourage the younger guys go to the competitions and let you are. But if, I said, listen, it doesn't matter where you place. I said it's about networking. You go and you meet people. You can put names to faces, and then you can meet a guy who might be able to take you out on a boat. And, yeah, you know, yeah. it just broadens your eyes, and you get to like meet the guys and learn from the guys and open the get opportunities to do different things. You know. Yeah, it was awesome. Hey, Shrek, Jeremy here, man. I'm back. Just wanted to say the podcast is growing from strength to strength, my friend. Hoorah, man. I just wanted to say thank you for your uh, continual support from the Noob Sparrow listeners, subscribing, reading, writing, and submitting kick-ass spearfishing adventures from all over the planet. Your listeners kick ass, and Shrek, my friend, so do you. All you guys, come check out the next edition of Spearing Magazine at spearingmagazine.com. Jeremy out. If your buddy had a blackout on your next spearfishing trip, think, what would the outcome of that be? Do you know how to revive someone from a blackout? Would you even be in a position to do something about it? Or would you be diving, chasing after a fish as your buddy sinks down to the bottom of the ocean? Do you know where most blackouts happen? Do you know what you can do to minimize your risk of having a blackout? My name is Ted Hardy, and I'm the founder of freedivingsafety.com. In my free online course, you will learn the truth about shallow water blackout, the myth of I don't push myself, I know my limits, I'm in tune with my body, how to minimize your risk of having a blackout, and most importantly, how to save your buddy's life if they have one. Visit freedivingsafety.com to sign up for your free course today. Dive safe out there. It's, It's not even that hard. Awesome. I want to pull you back full circle to just chat fins again and nuts and bolts stuff just briefly. Um, what what foot pocket have you settled on and why? I haven't settled in any foot pocket. Um, the guys come to me with whatever pockets they've got. Um, I like the puffles. Um, I like the puffles. And um, like I said, I do custom. So the guy will come to me and he say he's got these fins with these foot pockets and I'll just make him the blades to fit. Um, but if, I reckon, I think the Pathos is a very good pocket. The Amer, was it the Stingray Short? Is also the Amer's Razor or the Omer Stingray? The Omer Stingray, but the new one. It's, uh, they call it the Stingray. The short. It comes from the Stingray Short Blade, yeah. It's the, the side rails, the tendons on the side are a lot smaller. And it actually, believe it or not, it weighs 10 grams less than a Pathos, but you can remove them. So, But I, I like the Pathos. I've done quite a few blades with Pathos. Um, if I do the full set, I'm going to recommend the blade with the Pathos. But if it depends, I mean, if a guy if a guy's already got existing fins, then I'll just put it in whatever he's got. Are there many girls spearing in the Cape Town area? Like the water's freezing there. It doesn't seem like such a glamorous scene. It has female participation come up in in, in recent years. We have got women there. Um, well, here, there's one lady. She doesn't like me very much, but that's all right. Um, Mariette Deacher, and um, she's actually. <laughs> 
competed internationally. She had with CMS allowing spear fishermen or spear fishing the ladies thing that she actually got to go to Worlds and she competed there. I think she placed seventh, I think it was overall. Um, there's a couple of women around. Um, there's uh, quite a few more women in that towel. Taylor Davidoff, yeah, she said, I read something, she said, I never thought I'd progress to this point. It was with a bit of the help of the president of the South African Underwater Fishing Federation, Derek Marshall Dunning and my coach, who both saw potential in me and trained me to get to six national Freediving records and two world records for spearfishing. So I found that quite. Oh, that's cool. that's that's Talia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 Talia, uh, Talia's awesome, man. Um, it was actually quite funny. I actually met her when she was eleven years old. Um, she's actually a, she's Jewish, and her old her original surname is Davidoff. And um, she used to go to the the churches on a Friday, I think it was. And um, a friend of mine actually had a high risk protection thing. They used to do security around, and I actually met her through that. And I never saw her again fucking years and years and years. And then I went on a course with um, Trevor Hutton and she was there doing the course. And that's how we actually met up again. And um, at that stage, she was struggling with 30 meter depth, but that was in a place we call Blue Rock Quarry. It's, it's pitch black. I mean, it's like diving in the dark. And um, we, me and Matt came up with this brain fart. We just put a torch to the bottom of it, just below the base plate. And then all of a sudden you could see where you're going and, and that she put and that helped her. And um, but I mean now she's she'll dive circles around me. I mean, she, and she actually she it was actually her and her now husband Dan that actually came out to South Africa, and that's actually who we did our um, now free diving instructor course through. Wow! So it's gone like it's gone like a full circle. Yeah, we yeah, helped yeah, her, yeah. and now yeah. she's training us. And but she's awesome, and no, she's awesome. And I've done a lot of work with her, and a lot of the stuff. I mean, when she's done competitions, I've just sat on the phone. Talk to her, you know, about headspace. You know, I just help get her head right. Um, she's got an exceptional ability, but sometimes you know, you go, we call it monkeys in the back of your court. Yeah, yeah. Well, so much of um, well, I don't know. I look at competitive freediving. A lot of it seems to be mental headspace. Like, there's a bit of technique and stuff. Um, but there seems to be a lot of just um, like a lot of um, athletes. They they just sort of they do a very routine thing for them and they get their procedures and their technique down and then it's just really getting their headspace right. But um, it's a different thing to spearfishing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, I, when I free dive, you know, obviously there's a lot, everything's more relaxed and chilled and you slow everything down. Spearfishing, you've got a group of mates and the first guy down is going to get the fish. <laughs> you know? And um, but regarding headspace and anxiety, I mean, We've had it before, and I've seen it on multiple occasions where you're diving on a bank, you're doing a drift dive, and your friend dives down and he shoots a yellow tail. Your next friend dives down, he shoots a yellow tail. You dive down, you get nothing. <laughs> next guy dives. You know, it's just it's just luck of the draws, and it, it starts to play with your mind. It played with your mind so badly that we had a different dive, and um, a friend of ours wanted to quit spearfishing. I mean, it was just it was a, it was we were diving to 80 meters, which wasn't that deep, but that was like his max at the time. He's still quite a new guy. And every dive, every drift, we were putting a fish on the boat, and he just stood, his moor jumped on the boat and said, there's no claw, which means he's finished. And he wasn't going to dive again just because he got himself so worked up that he wasn't getting fish. And um, But he's diving still. I mean, he went about two weeks after that, went away on a holiday for a week, and he shot some fish, and now he's calmed down a bit. But anxiety is real. Yeah. You mentioned earlier, like uh, in your uh, your hunting story with the muscle cracker, that um, you know, like you had those progressive weeks of failure before eventually you landed one, and it wasn't even a fantastic one, but you were that stoked. You had like tears of joy. You were just absolutely stoked. And I think in spearfishing, there's like so much of that. Like some days, it can be the most frustrating sport in the world. Uh, and then the, the uh, but then the days where it all works and it all comes together with your mates and stuff, uh, and and fish play a part of it. But uh, like that's partly what makes it so rewarding because you there's so much perseverance and resilience that's required to, to be able to to get good at it to continue to do it. Like I think, and um, that's one of the reasons why we all love it. You no, know, well, I mean I always tell the guys, especially the new guys. I mean, and we actually spoke about it on Monday night at the course. You know what? Uh, just because somebody shot one good fish once doesn't make him a good diver. I said, the one thing about spearfishing is you need to be consistently good. If a guy's consistently good, he's a good diver. You know, and um, I mean, the thing about the spearfishing, every day is a different day. I mean, that one fish that you're so used to shooting, it's like, ah, oh, it's an easy shot and you just pull the trigger and you miss. You know, because you get that, you get that, we call it bintkhat, um, you get this, uh, oh, that's easy. And, you know, you just go, okay. I enjoy it. Every day is different. Um, sometimes a fish that you think is easy will take you for an arc, take you, make you look like a fool. 
That happens a lot. There's like we've got one fish this side. It's called the Garrick, which is in Afrikaans. It's called a leafish, which means a leatherfish. It's not a difficult fish to shoot. I mean, they'll come right up to you. But that is my nemesis because I've never shot one, but I've never seen one. You know, so uh, you can't shoot what you can't see. And um, again, Matt, being a dick, will love to say, "Oh, look, Derek, here's a picture of a Garrick a guy shot." And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so is that that would be my it would be my nemesis fish, not because it's a difficult fish to shoot. It's just I haven't shot one. I mean, we went to the Trans Sky once, and we went to this point which is known for Garrick to be summer. Okay. I'm going to go shoot my Garrick there. Never saw a Garrick, but I've got a cob there, so I wasn't too upset with it. But, you know, it's just you've always got that nemesis, that one fish of yours. And it's normally a fish that you can't shoot because it's got away from you. And, um, no, I mean, at one stage, I know that yellowfin tuna is not the hardest fish to shoot, but um, it took me seven trips to actually shoot my first yellowfin, oh, yellowfin, sorry. But it wasn't because I was shit. It's because we never saw any. And then the first one I actually got to shoot, we dive with a, a big boogie board with a bungee cord and a breakaway wick, and I shot the fish, and I was super stoked. I got this fish on. I was in the water by myself, and I pulled it up, and I got the second gun, and I swam down to shoot, and I put the second shot in. I didn't kill it. I let that gun go, and I carried on with the fish, and then the first line snapped, and then I just watched this tuna swim away with this 1.2 Rob Allen. And it was all like slow motion, and I saw the handle, and it almost looked like it was going to get caught in the bungee cord, and I dive and... I don't know what I was going to do, because if I grabbed that thing, it would bloody drown me anyway. So that was my first attempt at the yellowfin, and that cost me a gun, because um, it wasn't my gun, it was actually a friend's gun uh, replaced. Um, so yeah, I, there's always something you're going to learn. I mean, now I know if I put a second shot on a fish like that, I'm going to clip it on the board, because I've learned the hard way. But, you know, that's part of the sport. It's about learning. I mean, every day you're going to learn something new. So Matt sounds like a funny guy. I was going to ask you for a funny story, but you've bloody already fed me about, I don't know, half a dozen from Matt. He sounds like a real character of a dive buddy. Uh, we have good days. I mean, the, I've got a, we've got a lot of good friends. I mean, like I say, we'll get in the car. And the one thing I love about the sport is like, I've never laid on the bottom of the ocean going, oh, shit, I forgot to send the email or my lovely wife is sitting over there pissing me off or nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting looked at now. But anyway, um, you know, it's like, we're just like the guys we dive with. I mean, I suppose that applies to everybody. It's like we're just a great group of friends. And, I mean, we're friends in and out of the water. We we don't socialize too often because it just goes raucous. I mean, there's a lot of booze involved in that. But, you know, we always have a laugh. There's always somebody being stupid. There's always somebody that's done something stupid, you know, and there's always somebody taking the piss out of somebody else. And, um, you know, I've I learned this thing like – She's probably going to get upset with me now, but it's like closer to the weekend that can be sometimes you become a bit of a dick and then she'll be like, just go fucking dive. You know, it's just like a, it's a, it's a strategy move, you know? So she knows when I come back off the dive, I'm a lot more relaxed and I'm, you know, it's just, I really enjoy the sport. Um, I met, like I said to you before, I met some really great people. Um, and I do a lot of work with Matt. Um, we've traveled the country, um, doing the courses and, uh, Sometimes I think his wife thinks well. He, she, she sees me more, and uh, I see more of him than she does. But um, no, nah, he's a good guy, and um, I've got a, a good couple of friends. Um, and um, yeah, we just have a. In general, it's just good fun. I mean, it's I don't. From the minute I get in a car to drive something, like I say, sometimes we do a four-hour road trip up and down, so it's eight hours of driving, and we just have a job. I mean. The one time we drove up there to Strace by a bit of dive, you know, I I didn't have a great dive because I had a bit of back pressure. So we came off the water early and I went and I said, listen, we've got to stop at the one pub. I need to go to the bathroom. So we went there and I came out and I get back in the car. Now we've got to drive 200 kilometers back, which is not responsible. But then in the middle of the back seat, there's a cardboard box. And while I went to the bathroom, they went and bought a bottle of brandy, six beers, two glasses and a bag of ice and a two liter of Coke. Now we're going home. And, um, <laughs> so the other day we stopped and we, we just got our 500 more Cokes and our samosas and then um, we, we stopped there and Matt just stopped, he jumped out of the car, ran into the bottle store and got a half jack of brandy and we had to top up our bottles of Coke with brandy, you know, so um, we do, yeah, it's just general good fun, eh? it's, you meet some really great people, which is nice. Back to infinite practicalities before we head out the gate. Um, Derek, um, dive bag, what's in your dive bag? So for a head to toe sort of like your um just your day to day dive gear in Cape Town, what are you what are you using? Well my dive bag currently has got like three different masks in it. But anyway, actually, you know, obviously fins, we normally dive here in a five more wetsuit. Um mask, snorkel, weight belt, gloves. What else in my dive bag? Hydroglide. Um a normal diving kit, I mean Generally, my bag, like I said, it's always, literally always has three different masks in it. So I've got my free diving mask, and I've got which is the plastic lens, curved, fancy, low profile thing. And then I've got my spear fishing masks. 
Um, normally have two wetsuits. Uh, and yeah, just the general kit. Uh. Why two wetsuits? Because depending on where we're going for the temperature, because sometimes there's a combination of I'll wear a three more pant and a five more jacket if it's a bit warmer, or my straight um, my straight five more if it's a bit colder. Um, you know, it just depends where we dive. And um, I learned I used to you know what when I sorry when I got into it I like I said about the gear slot thing I bought all these fancy chickly smooth skin wetsuits, and they're great but they tend to explode. You know, and I've had it where they explode at the wrong time. I was busy with the nationals and we're diving and hunting in the shallows for muscle cracker and I, the thing exploded on me. And the only other wetsuit on the boat was a seven mole jacket. I didn't have enough weight. So I was floating around like a cork trying to hunt a fish on the bottom, which I couldn't get to. So I've moved away from those things. But I, um, just general, just usual. And hydroglides hide this uh, this lubricant you're using for, for helping to get wetsuits on. Is that right? It's actually yeah, it's a product that actually Matt came up with, and um, he actually came across the ingredients. And this is quite I don't know if I should say this, but it's actually they use it for vaginal dryness, <laughs> so that's where it comes from. <laughs> but it's it works well. I mean, I I'm, I'm one of those old school guys. I got taught that would use the cheap little Colgate conditioner, and that's what I've always used. You smell like apples, which is great. And then the odd time you go to the shop on the way to get a dive because I've never really planned, and the only flavour they've got is the egg flavoured one, and you come out smelling of egg. Which is never very good, but um, yeah, I know the product works well, and the guys that have used it are loving it. So yeah, we've been playing around. Obviously, with us being in South Africa, um, we started doing the free diving thing. Um, a lot of the stuff we've had to manufacture ourselves. We manufacture our own floats. We manufacture our own um, base plates, and you know, we're doing a lot of that ourselves. So um, we've got our own dive bags going now. And um, what actually happened was a guy ordered a pair of carbons from me, and um, he. He had his kit stolen out the back of his car, so he said he's going to replace his repair my carbons. And he said to me, he also wants one of my dive, my fin bags. I'm like, okay. And then I'm like, I don't have a fin bag. So we made fin bags. So, you know, we're all slowly but surely building up on our, like uh, what we can do and what we sell and stuff like that. So, yeah. So where can people just check out any of your gear? Like, is there a website or? We've got a Shopify link for, um, we see, remember I spoke to you about when I started my fins, I called it Atlantic. Yeah, yeah. We all, and I changed that. We always had the logo. So then when we started doing the Naui stuff, um, it was better for us to have a shop for the Naui stuff. So we just used the Atlantic logo that I had and we created that virtual shop and we've got our online Spotify, Shopify, so Shopify. Okay. Is that DMD? No, no, DMD. Oh, D- DMDfins.com is coming soon, I see. Yeah, it's been coming soon for about a year. I'm a bit slow with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's something I need to sort out. No, I can send you the link, but it's a Shopify link, and it's um, Atlantic Freediving. Um, that's what we trade under. So it's just a small little Shopify thing. And, um, yeah, my fins are on there as well and some of the other stuff we do. Um, but, yeah, it's just all coming together. The thing is, with us doing the freediving courses, we've had quite a few guys asking about kit, you know, and, I mean, so that's sort of – we're just trying to fill a gap there that we can actually supply the guys' kit and, um, yeah, I'm – we just try something, the stuff we want to sell, stuff that we think is decent. We don't want to just sell any product. If it's something we put on there, we actually believe it's got some merit in it, you know? You guys are kind of spoiled in that part of the world, though. Like, considering, like, how bad logistics are um, to and from South Africa, like, you guys have done remarkably well. Like, Rabbitek and Rob Allen, Rob Allen particularly likes huge brand, probably, if not, you know, the most well-known um, spearfishing brand in the world these days. Um, like, yeah, like you guys have done remarkably well for you. And I love seeing innovators and, and people just having a crack doing something new by themselves. And um, it's it's awesome to see spearfishing slowly, you know, get better and better and better with gear. I know it's not all about gear, but it's still cool to see the innovation and, and um, see Spiros just, just, just trying to make a go of it. Oh, listen, the guys, I mean, the guys have been doing it for years. And, I mean, they the, the build proper equipment. I mean, they build stuff that's made to last and that. And, um there's, I mean, I've been to Rob Allen. There's been, I've been fortunate enough to actually be to the shop. And the, and the thing is, if you go to the shop, I expected this massive. It's, it's it's not the shop is the shop the the physical shop is actually quite tiny. I mean, the physical shop is probably the size of the the area behind you. And um, but their workshop, no, that's a different level. That's a massive thing, you know. So. But they've got a good thing going. I mean, Rabbitech's also been going. There's a couple of guys. There's also free divers that come from Natal. They also make their own gear. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of small guys that are around that are doing their own things like modifying guns, making hybrid roller guns and inverted rollers. And, 
I think the guys are always busy looking at little things, niche things that they can do and get in the market. And like I said, the, the fins was never something I planned on. It just came. So I'm busy with that. Oh, cool. DMD fins on Instagram. Anyway, um, Derek, we're going to head out with a faster paced round of questions. It's called Spiro Q&A. Are you ready? Okay. Not really, but let's go. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the single best piece of advice you've ever been given for spearfishing? I think probably just be safer. Think that, no, oh, there we go. There we go. That's a good one. No fish is worth your life there. Oh, good. I like it. Um, if you could go back to when you started, what would you do differently? Um, I would have joined the club sooner so I could actually learn more. And, um, you know, I went around head, like a headless chicken for a while. So I'd definitely try to get join a club and learn from people. And, oh, what's something a little different that you do in your spearfishing than everyone else? Something I do that's different. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, well, I suppose, but I, like I tell the guys, when I hunt, I try to be a hunter, but not be a threat, if that makes any sense. I mean, the fish, you, you got to be there. The fish are going to see you. But And I say, I say this to a lot of the new guys. I said, you got to be hunting. you got to be a predator, but you mustn't look like a threat. That's probably the only thing. But the way I hunt, I try just be them. Yeah, I suppose that's it then. Cool. And last question. Last question. What does the what does the spearfishing experience mean to you in one or two sentences? It's a way of life. It's my way of life. Um, we every weekend if there's if there's water we go dive. Um, it's that bad. And my little boat called Titan Uranus. And um, before I know it, yeah, a WhatsApp group has been started by JC and. I'm added to this WhatsApp group and I'm going diving. It's just, you know, it's, we dive. If the weather's right, we dive. I mean, any, I mean, if there's a chance to go somewhere and they say, well, listen, we're going 200 Ks the weekend, we get in the car and we go. It's not, I mean, my wife knows, so I'm very fortunate she tolerates me. And um, I keep on looking at her, I just see if we get a response out of her. And um, she, but she knows if the weather's right, we're going to go dive, and she doesn't have a problem with that touch wood. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just it's what we do every weekend's a diving weekend. If it's a diving weekend, we're diving. Awesome. If there's water, we dive. It's a good note to end on, Derek. Really enjoyed chatting with you. And um, DMD fins on Instagram, and uh, I'll link up in the show notes today at noobspirit.com forward slash DMD. I'll link up your Shopify store as well, so people can check that out. But uh, and also your courses as well, because um, I think that's a that's great- also on the that's also on the Shopify. No problem. I'll link that up in today's show notes. Noobspirit.com forward slash DMD, Derek. Pleasure chatting with you. I really enjoyed it and hearing about uh, your take on spearfishing. Thanks. It's been great. And listen, I'll drop those recipes for you guys as well, okay? All right, man. Love it. Bash. They're good. All right, man. Cool. Yeah. Oh, for everyone else, it's not uh, noobspirit.com forward slash submit recipe, and you can put in your own recipe. So, no, thanks for reminding me. Cheers, Derek. All right. Cheers. Take care. Guys, how cool was that? At DMD Fins on Instagram, Derek Marshall Dunning, what an absolute gentleman. I really loved hearing a little bit about some South African spearfishing from the rugged old Cape Town. Those visuals uh, fill my mind after watching that My Octopus Teacher. So really cool to have Derek on the show and, uh, some, as usual, some actionable information for you. Um, next week, I'm after, off to chat with another podcast host. His name is Tony Alcock. Um, his podcast is called Taz Yarns. It was Yarns with Az and Taz, but... Tony's gone out solo now due to the frequency issues with being able to pair up with his uh, offsider and get episodes out. So at Taz Yarns is officially launched. He's got a couple of cracking episodes up there. But anyway, the next podcast episode is with Tony or Taz, and uh, we chat tropical North Queensland spearfishing. It was an absolute treasure, uh, an absolute treat, sorry. Um, Sam Vesey from the UK. Here's his voicemail before we head on out of here. Um, as usual, thanks for your support. If you love the show, leave us a review. Leave a voicemail at noobspirit.com like Sam's done here. Um or if you really, really, really love the podcast, become a patron listener at patreon.com forward slash Noob Sparrow. I'm out. Hey Noob Sparrow, I am Sam Vesey, a long-time listener and a sort of UK-based spear fisherman at the moment. Um, I just want to say thank you for all the actionable information I've obtained over the years from everyone involved with the show, and it's certainly accelerated the learning processes for me much, much faster than what it would have been without the show. And I just want to say really to those starting out spearfishing, just don't be afraid to ask questions, as silly as it may sound, you know, and reach out to the more experienced. I myself as a novice was actually 
too scared of looking silly and asking questions, so in turn made a lot of stupid mistakes, and one of which was becoming entangled in a float line with a pretty large kingfish, which I believe probably could have cost me my life that day. Um, my advice would be to steer clear from the cheap, nasty, thin orange float lines that you get free um, with the cheaper floats. Fork out a few bucks for a thicker, less tangleable one. Um, I did head back to New Zealand a couple of years later to get revenge on a large kingy. So props to my good mate Tim on roof for that trip. That was epic, and you should really get that dude on the show. Very, very experienced young spear fisherman with a lot under his belt. Um, this is my second season now back in the UK. I'm living out of my camper van down in the south of England all summer. Um, just a spearfish, as crazy as that may sound to some of you, maybe not to others. Um, this year, I'm going to get way more involved with the competition side of things. Um, and a big shout out to all the UK spearfishing Facebook pages on social media and whatnot. UK spearfishing buddies and Southwest spearfishing. Great communities, great bunch of girls and guys from all over. And I'm hoping to catch a, a lot more of you this summer to share the stoke with. Um, if you want a nifty tip on how not to lose your dive knife and to secure it to your sheath using an elasticated cord, I have a video on YouTube. It's called Have You Ever Lost Your Dive Knife by On The Road Spearfishing. Um, also, feel free to hit me up on social media. If you want to meet up this summer for a dive or ask any advice on spearfishing, don't be shy. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Dive safe and enjoy the journey. Cheers. Today's new Spiro podcast is proudly brought to you in partnership with Adreno Spearfishing Supplies for your next piece of spearfishing equipment. Head to adreno.com.au. Enjoy flat rate shipping Australia wide. There's a huge range of gear and you can save $20 on every purchase over $200 when you use the code NoobSpiro. Better yet, Drop into their Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne or Perth mega stores. There's another one on the way, by the way. Use the code NoobSpiro to save in store or online at adreno.com.au. Boom. Are you a US-based diver? Great news. Today's show sponsor, Neptonics.com, have got a deal for you. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off anything and everything at Neptonics.com. Equipment you can rely on, solid gear that works. Even when you get all limp biscuit on it, you'll struggle to break stuff. 